Good morning. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Welcome to this morning's panel discussion, which is focused around the question, are we able to procure, upgrade, and adapt to meet the demands of great power competition? Special thanks to Lockheed Martin as our sponsor for this panel. We couldn't put on the, this event, we couldn't put on our panel discussions without the uh, support of our sponsors. So special thanks to uh, Lockheed Martin, represented here this morning by Dion Vergutz. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's panel, Mr. Brian Clark, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Brian is an expert in naval operations, electronic warfare, autonomous systems, military competition, and wargaming. From 2013 to 2019, Brian served as a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, where he led studies for the DOD Office of Net Assessment, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and DARPA on new technologies and the future of warfare. Mr. Clark also served as a special assistant to the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Greenert, and director of his Commander's Action Group, where he led development of Navy strategy and implemented new initiatives in electromagnetic spectrum operations, undersea warfare, expeditionary operations, and personnel and readiness management. In addition, Brian is a retired Navy submarine officer, and he's an expert moderator who moderated a panel for us at Defense Forum Washington just a couple of months ago. So Brian, the panel is yours. Oh, thank you, Bill, I appreciate it. That was very nice, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm honored to be here with these august gentlemen who um, are obviously much more expert than I in the topic that we're gonna discuss today. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce them, and then we'll go into uh, the panel discussion. So first of all, uh, to my left, my immediate left, Admiral Tom Moore is the current commander of Naval Sea Systems Command, uh, a second generation naval officer. He was commissioned in 1981 from the United States Naval Academy, uh, a glutton for punishment. He was a surface Navy nuke, uh, which uh, is probably the hardest job I think of in the Navy, and uh, was served on several ships, South Carolina, Virginia, um, and the Enterprise in the nuclear world, as well as Koinonam and uh, other uh, conventional ships as a surface warfare officer. He then uh, was selected in 1994 to the engineering duty officer, or, I'm sorry, the engineering duty officer community, and uh, led projects for overhauls of aircraft carriers, including the Enterprise, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, and the Nimitz, before taking over as in-service carriers program manager, uh, where he was in charge of uh, new construction and overhauls of Nimitz-class carriers, such as the George H.W. Bush uh, and the RCOH, the refueling overhaul of the Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, Commander, or a Admiral Moore commanded uh, the PEO uh, Program Executive Office for Aircraft Carriers uh, until 2016 when he took over his current job as uh, the 44th Commander of Naval Sea Systems Command, overseeing a staff of 73,000 people that uh, support our Navy's submarines, uh, service ships, and uh, associated systems. To Admiral Moore's uh, left is Admiral uh, Dean Peters, who is the Commander of Naval Air Systems Command. Uh, he's a 1985 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, as well as being a graduate of the Navy's Test Pilot School. Uh, he's a, he, previous to uh, his uh, time now as the Commander of Naval Air Systems Command, uh, he earned his wings as Naval Aviator in 1986, uh, commanded the Navy's Air Test and Evaluation Squadron, HX-21, uh, and was Program Manager for H-60 uh, helicopters once he turned, became a, a member of the acquisition community. Uh, until 2014, uh, Admiral Peters commanded the Presidential Helicopters Office and uh, then took over Commander Naval Air Warfare Center Atlantic Divi Aircraft Division uh, and was the Assistant Nav Air Commander for Research and Engineering. Uh, he assumed his current role uh, as Naval Air, S Air Systems Commander in 2018. To uh, Admiral Peters' left is uh, General Arthur Basajan. Uh, of the Marines. He is the commander of the Marine Systems Command. Uh, he enlisted in the Marine Corps back in 1987 uh, and was commissioned in 1990 after uh, going through an officer candidate program. Uh, his assignments as a logistician in the Marines included command at every level from platoon up to uh, the uh, battalion command level. Uh, he deployed with the 11th View to uh, Somalia as part of Operation Continuing Hope and uh, it deployed for Operations Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. Once he uh, entered the acquisition community, he was program manager for the uh, infantry combat equipment uh, until 2010, uh, was in charge of operational test evaluation activity for the Marine Corps until 2014, 
and was military assistant for the Assistant Secretary of Defense for acquisition in the Office of the Secretary of Defense until 2016 when he took over as the Chief of Staff for Marine Corps Systems Command and then took over in 2018 as the Commander of Marine Corps, Air, Marine Corps Systems Command. To uh, General Bosasian's left is, uh, oh, I got out of order here. Uh, Admiral Nathan Moore from the Coast Guard. Uh, he is the uh, uh, curr currently the Deputy Commander for uh, Coast Guard Pacific, uh, following assignments as the Chief of Staff there. Uh, he was Commander of the Coast Guard Cutter Stratton, and uh, previous to that was served on Polar Star, Harriet Lane, the Coast Guard C uh, Cutter Venturous, and Coast Guard Cutter Resolute. He is. Um, He served from uh, 2013 to 2015 as Chief of Office of Naval Engineering at the Coast Guard Headquarters and uh, has been a registered uh, professional engineer in the state of Michigan since 1999. And then to uh, Admiral Moore's left is uh, Admiral uh, Kurt Christian Boris Becker, a uh, native of New York City, who uh, graduated in 1987 from Boston University and uh, was commissioned in the Naval Reserve Officers Training Corps program after that. Uh, he's served as a EA-6B Prowler Electronic Warfare or Electronic Countermeasures Officer, ECMO, and as a plank owner of the Joint Crew uh, Composite Squadron 1, JIX-1, a special mission unit, unit designed to uh, apply electronic warfare in the fight against improvised explosive devices in Iraq and Afghanistan. A member of the Aerospace Engineering Duty Officer Community and Space Cadre, uh, Admiral Becker has held positions in Naval Sea Systems Command and Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command. Uh, he's also served as a systems engineer and deputy division chief at the Naval Reconnaissance or National Reconnaissance Office. Uh, and he served at uh, Naval Air Station Patuxen River as the chief engineer. Uh, as program manager for the National Security Space Program, uh, Admiral Becker uh, led interagency and joint forces providing national joint and naval forces intelligence information, and as well as being commander of SPA Wars uh, space a field activity, um, leading the uh, civilians and sailors supporting the NRO. Uh, he's been the P PEO C4I and the PEO Space Systems uh, from 2013-2017 and took over NAVWAR, his current position, uh, in 2017, where he leads a workforce of 10,500 civilian and military personnel. So we're very honored to have these gentlemen on our panel today to talk about the, uh, how, we how we develop and field capabilities faster uh, and do it in a way that's able to deal with our great power competitors such as Russia and China. So to the floor here really kind of highlights the challenge that the Navy and Marine Corps and Coast Guard are facing today, which is the introduction of new technologies like we see with you know, AWS and Nokia and uh, other companies uh, like Juniper Systems, Oracle, that are here to help the government try to field new data management and communications uh, technologies, uh, while at the same time sustaining our existing capabilities, which are centered around legacy systems, platforms like ships and aircraft and submarines. Um, the introduction of those new technologies is being, uh, has been a very challenging proposition for each of these gentlemen to deal with. Uh, it's something the U.S. government has wrestled with in the acquisition community. And so the first question I guess I would have for our panelists is, how do we, how do we intend to incorporate new technologies into our current and planned force uh, more quickly? So what are some of the avenues to do that? Um, we've got the new mid-tier acquisition uh, approach that's been approved by the Office of the Secretary of Defense. We've got prototyping that's being done at various levels of the government, um, both competitive prototyping and single uh, provider pr prototyping. Uh, we've got our traditional acquisition system that slowly introduces technologies into new, new capabilities. Um, and then we've got new approaches that might look at trying to bring together uh, capabilities in multiple domains through wargaming and experimentation and try to put things together in the field that wouldn't have been developed otherwise uh, by the acquisition program. So there's a number of new approaches out there to try to bring these new technologies into the naval force. And a question for each of you is, how do you envision the future of this going? How are we going to be able to incorporate new technologies? And how can industry access the government to be able to offer what they're developing in their own labs and their own experimentation? So Admiral Moore, we'll start. Okay, with you. well thanks, thanks Brian for that, that introduction and for, and for the question. So, I think it's important that, you know, you look at the, the, the panel, which is are we able to procure, upgrade, and adapt to meet great power competition. I think you mentioned it there, but I think you have to add in there, are we able to procure, upgrade, and sustain and maintain what, what we have. So there's a, 
it's not an either or. Uh, we tend to focus most of our effort on the buying of new stuff and getting new technology out to the ships uh, faster, uh, but there's a key element on the sustainment side uh, that we have to focus on. So I think the answer is a quali I would say is an absolute yes if. I tend to focus uh, on getting after things in that realm. And so the answer is yeah, we absolutely uh, can do this, but we're gonna have to think about the problems I think differently than, than we're doing today challenge a bunch of the assumptions that are out there, and in many ways, uh, stop doing things that are adding no value to the things that we're adding to the fleet today, and there's, there's a number of those things. Um, you, know, you mentioned up front some of the new acquisition authorities, some of, the, some of those things. Those will absolutely help, but having been an acquisition professional now for 25 plus years, uh, my experience has been that you know, t tweaking DDG, D DOD 5000 always sounds good on paper, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really get you the outcomes that you're looking at. So we ought to, we ought to take advantage of those authorities uh, to be more agile and to get things out to the, to the fleet quicker. Uh, but I don't think you can rely uh, solely on, on what's on a piece of paper and an acquisition regulation to do that. I other think there's also another uh, part of this. Uh, we tend to focus on the speed to the fleet uh, piece. That, that's obviously critically important. But it's the, the, I think the thing you have to also focus on is speed to the fleet of what? And so we can get things out to the fleet fast, but if you're not getting things out to the fleet fast, what they're looking for, or things out to the fleet fast that can be sus are sustainable and are agile and can adapt to the future, then checking off that box of, of fast is, really doesn't do you any good. So I, th I think we need to focus on more than just the speed portion of it. I think that's a, that's a critical piece about getting this right. Um, we tend to focus most of our efforts on the, on the shipbuilding side of the house and speed to fleet on the shipbuilder and most of our wrath uh, is focused on them. Uh, I think uh, that the, what I've seen over the past 25 years is uh, the most of the shipbuilders out there, or all the shipbuilders want to do the right job, uh, the people that are inserting technology. The most important thing is on the Navy side of, uh, for us is to build a plan and build a set of requirements uh, and make sure industry understands what those is are and we have a common understanding of that. That's, I think, the absolute key at the end of the day. We tend to, you know, say uh, we want a car that goes zero to 60 in 2.7 seconds. I want it to be the best handling car. I want it to have a bow steerer system. I want it to have leather. I want it all this other stuff. And I'll, I'll say to you, well, that sounds like a Porsche 911 GTS. And, and the Pentagon will say, that's exactly what I want. I want a Porsche 911 GTS. And we'll take them down to the Porsche dealer and there it is. And they'll say, that's exactly what I want. That's perfect. Let's do that. And uh, the Porsche dealer will say, well, that's, that's $145,000. And the Pentagon will say, well, I only have $85,000, but that's the car I want, so why don't you go ahead and give it to me? And so I think we've got to be more realistic about, you know, when we're talking about the speed is getting those requirements uh, set up front. I think, uh, to, to your point, uh, the key to, way to do that, and I'll finish up my remarks here and turn it over to my friend Dean Peters, is get industry involved in the process as early as, po as possible about what the art of the possible is and have those trade-offs. I think a good example of that uh, is, the, is gonna be the FFGX program that's gonna come out here pretty soon. Uh, that has moved pretty quickly from requirements definition to a point where we're gonna ready to, to, lay, to down select and issue a construction contract. And that's been as collaborative I've seen with industry on what, what the art of the possible is up front. So I think that's the model that you want to take, you want to follow uh, up, up front. So I look forward to the rest of the questions from the panel, and Dean, you know, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, just by way of introduction, uh, the Naval Air Systems Command uh, supports all things av naval aviation, uh, to include uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps, and we also support the Coast Guard too. I was just uh, discussing with Rare Admiral Moore beforehand some of the projects that we're working on for the Coast Guard. Uh, also by way of introduction, uh, I think it's uh, apparent to everyone, uh, certainly who's ever been in the job, uh, that our program managers are under incredible pressure. Uh, it's certainly uh, one of, if not the most dynamic major command position that we put our uh, Navy captains in and our Marine Corps colonels. Uh, and so all of these things that we're talking about is really, uh, you know, helping the program managers be successful. Uh, on the NAVAIR side, uh, we're trying to improve every day. Uh, I want to echo what uh, Emma Moore said about sustainment. The first thing we have to do is fix readiness. 
it doesn't do us a whole lot of good to field a lot of capability if it's never available. Uh, we've had some successes there. You all are very familiar with, say, the physiological episodes that we've had in Navy aircraft. Those are way, way down this year. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, I, I see Kramer there in the front row uh, from BFA-2. We want to make sure that he's able to go out and do his mission and not have to worry about the oxygen system or the pressurization system. So we're, we're fixing the readiness piece uh, even as we are working on ways to accelerate uh, delivery of capability. The capability delivery, you can think about it in two different aspects. The, the first is really uh, what are we doing on the acquisition side to speed things up? Uh, and there's many things that I can talk about uh, if you're interested in those. Uh, there's also the organic capability for developing new technologies that we have at our warfare centers and our labs. Uh, I think that's a key aspect of, uh, you know, getting technology delivered and in the hands of the warfighter. Uh, at the same time, though, we have to realize that no single entity can do everything. Uh, there's no single entity in industry, there's no single entity in the government that can field a complete weapon system. It has to be a cooperation. So uh, to Mr. Clark's question in regarding, you know, how can industry access government, uh, we do have cooperative research and development agreements that we have with industry for the use of our test ranges and our laboratories and things like that where we can actually get out and demonstrate technology and maybe uh, speed up the requirements review process and get interest that doesn't have to wait for the entire POM cycle. Uh, and that's where I'll leave you uh, at this point and uh, happy to follow up on any of those topics as we go forward. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, General. Good morning. Uh, my name is A.J. Pasagian and uh, it's a pleasure to sit up here with uh, this group and uh, be provided the opportunity to share some of these thoughts uh, from the Marine Corps' perspective. Um, the Congress has given us a lot of authorities in the uh, 2016 NDAA. I'm going to focus on that at a kind of reflection point uh, for the United States for Marine Corps where the tilt is definitely on modernization. Um, I think notably uh, the, the, the leadership is focused on Section 804 and 806. 804 is a mid-tier approach that you heard uh, mentioned up here, I think, twice already. Um, and that really enables us to uh, uh, get after two very practical pathways to fielding a capability earlier. The other is 806. I think 806 is probably the most helpful piece of legislation we've had in a really long time. 806 enables us um, to, to bring in, through a, a variety of means, early industry participation and tap that, that piece of industry, that component of industry um, that's, that's sort of non-traditional, innovative. I think the speed of research and development uh, on the commercial sector relative to what we do in government is something like three to one, just very general terms. We want to take advantage of that. Um, so OTAs give us that, that type of uh, access and competitive prototyping under uh, 806 enables us to take what we've learned there, what we've seen, put it in the hands into the meat hooks of American Marines, and then get into production without having to go through another round of competition. That is really helpful when we're really uh, getting after uh, a very distinct modernization effort in the Marine Corps. At Systems Command, at Marine Corps Systems Command, we've awarded 41 OTAs, roughly a 50-50 split in consortiums and our own. Um, I think that what you've seen in the real world for uh, our PM for Wargaming, uh, Force on Force Next, uh, uh, anti-ground-based uh, uh, ship interdiction systems, those types of activities are being supported by what I mentioned, 804 and 806. The CPG is really our catalyst, and uh, the Commandant's been very uh, vocal and I think very practical in terms of where, where it is we need to go. So this is driving us. Getting there with the Navy is absolutely essential. Um, and when we come together to do these kinds of things, it's actually a pretty fearsome uh, team. So I'm really excited to be a part of it. I think the new law helps us and our PEOs and what it is that we're getting ready to do. 
Um, I'm happy to be up here and discuss some of that uh, and look forward to taking some of your questions. Thank you. Thanks, General. Uh, Admiral Moore. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. The, the other Admiral Moore up here, uh, not to be confused, we've been on a few panels uh, already this year, so we, I think we've got the, the drill down. But uh, for the Coast Guard side, uh, thanks for, for, for inviting us and uh, including me here. Uh, I'm the sustainment guy for the Coast Guard. You know, we're, we're small enough that we, we have one organization that runs uh, sustainment, sustainment of our cutters and aircraft and the, uh, and the shore facilities that we have, and that's me. And uh, what I worry about today in terms of great power competition is how we uh, make the Coast Guard successful in our current uh, big surge of, of acquisition that we have going on. And for those of you in the audience that, uh, that pay attention, the booths out here on the floor, uh, we're in the middle of the biggest recapitalization of our uh, surface and air fleet that we've ever undergone. So we have national security cutters, which are basically uh, frigates painted white with, a, uh, with an orange stripe on them uh, that come out of Huntington Ingalls. Um, we've got eight of those uh, on our way to 11 or, or more. Potentially, uh, we have uh, an offshore patrol cutter that's going to be built down in Panama City. We've got a program record of 25 of those coming. Uh, we have brand new fast response cutters. These are uh, offshore patrol boats um, that are that have come out of Bollinger, and we've got about 35 of those on a on a way to a program of 58 of those. Uh, Aircraft-wise, we've got new C-130Js uh, that come off the line for us every year. We've got uh, the C-27Js that we're that we're having missionized. Uh, through, through, and NAVAIR is helping us quite a bit with that. So in the midst of all that recapitalization, we also have the really, really old built in the 1960s and 70s Coast Guard that you still see out there. We have about 200, and if you just look at ships, we have about 230 cutters that go offshore, uh, not, not the station boats that do search and rescue, but the actual offshore uh, law enforcement and defense cutters. Um, we got about 230 something of those, and you know, more than half of them were built back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. They have pneumatic controls uh, from the engine room. Uh, they're pretty cyber hardened because there is nothing you can hack. Uh, so that makes our cyber people happy. But they're antiquated. And, and for me, as the sustainment guy, I worry about how we uh, are going to move forward with these new uh, national security cutters, for example, that are worldwide deployers. Uh, we just sent two of them uh, over to the Seventh Fleet uh, this year, this past year, to deploy. Uh, in, a, in a South China Sea and, and up and around Korea doing UN Security Council uh, resolution enforcement. So, you know, they're, they're worldwide deployers. They refuel at sea, and then, and then we balance that again with these, these old ships uh, that were built so long ago. So on the sustainment side, as we deal with parts obsolescence and new modernized uh, control systems and cybersecurity uh, issues, that's, that's kind of my primary concern when I think about uh, how we uh, prepare ourselves for great power competition. Thank you. Thanks, Admiral. Admiral Backer. Uh, good morning. Uh, pleasure to be here with you uh, once again uh, to talk about how we need to go faster in acquisition. Um, I think we talked about that last year, and then we talked about that the year before, uh, and the year before that, and we're going to talk about it next year. Um, so how do we go faster? Well, well first, I kind of want to get a sense of who's in the audience. Um, so uh, uniform members of our allies and, and U.S., you can raise your hands. Okay, industry, academia, PLA. <laughs> As we talk about great power competition and we talk about going faster, <clears throat> for us uh, in the information business, uh, there are a couple of ways we can get after that. Uh, part of it is the acquisition authorities that my colleagues have already discussed, whether that's OTA or SBIRs, in fact, uh, we have an OTA called the Information Warfare Research Project, which has over 400, actually now up to 500 uh, participants. Um, and we're moving fast. We're awarding contracts. The average contract value is about 1.3 million. Um, what I'm looking for, though, is how those contracts then lead to production. Uh, and so I'm, I'm looking for the proof in that pudding. But we're going fast with that sort of stuff. Uh, that's part of it, the acquisition strategies, if you will, about how to go faster. But then there's the technical side. And for our, in our world of information, part of that is modernizing the networks. How do we modernize the networks so that the software, which are the weapons, if you will, uh, that we're going to put in the network, can move there faster? How do we develop the software more quickly? Well, one way is to use things like a, a software armory, where we allow folks to come into that armory, uh, if you will, and use 
the tools and the procedures and the standards to rapidly develop capability, test it, and move it into production. Well, then you gotta secure it. Right. So now we look at the securing process. What does that take? How long does it take to get an ATO? The answer, too long. Uh, so how do we accelerate that? Accelerate the software development, accelerate the ATO delivery. Uh, in order to do that, though, we need that fundamental network layer to be agile enough with the right rule sets so that all the players that are bringing weapon, weapons capabilities, i.e. software, whether it's command and control or ISR or METOC or fill in the blank, know how to develop to that app store, if you will, uh, then develop that capability in conjunction with the using user community so we know we're solving the right problem and then get that out in the field with an ATO operating, ready for sailors to operate and maintain it. Acquisition authorities, technical architectures, and oh, by the way, the data. How do we make sure we're using the data as the resource that it really is? And we talk about digitizing our Navy. I don't know if there's a, a verbification of the word data, uh, but maybe there should be. Uh, because data, well, somebody once said data is the new bacon. Uh, so I think we better get after our approach to how we use that valuable resource. Thanks. Thanks, Admiral. Uh, so that brings up a, a, a point that I think would uh, be good to explore further is um, you've all talked about um, you know, mechanisms that we're using to try to speed the introduction of new technologies into the fleet. Uh, I think one of the challenges that we're going to face going forward is to deal with a great power competitor. Any of our capabilities are going to require you know, highly integrated um, uh, systems between different domains, different platforms to be able to deliver a mission capability. So whereas before we might have had the luxury of developing a new weapon system in a stovepipe, um, we now don't have that luxury when you're dealing with competitors like China and, and Russia to a lesser degree. Um, so for example, we talk about expeditionary advanced base operations, deploying Marines on shore, using uh, counter maritime capabilities to contribute to the naval fight. Um, you're, that's, now you're bringing together capabilities from pretty much every one of these or organizations that you represent. How are we going to deliver mission capability um, through an acquisition and uh, engineering development process that's kind of stovepipe by nature? Yeah. So, so the, General, you can, to you go first. I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that one first. So, um, when General Berger spent his time at, at Combat Development and Integration, uh, we spent a lot of time giving this thought because we saw what was coming. And we developed a plan that's, that's threat-based and is projected out in a 10-year time horizon. So our, our target set right now is 2030. And in 2019, as a, um, as a Marine, you're sitting there and you're like, okay, and you happen to understand this acquisition business, you, you look at FY20 as the entry point, the line of departure into the first fit up to, to make these changes. Um, General Berger coined the term of, of the three amigos. So for force development, and, and it's no secret, you, you know, I, I carry the CPG with me. I've read this thing about 18 times. Every time I read it, I learn something new. But the first priority for the Marine Corps is force design and then into force development. And what the three amigos do is they execute force development for the service. So in Quantico, we happen to be blessed by the fact that I can literally run to any one of these commands um, hardly breaking a sweat. We're really, really close proximity, we work well together. We go to the club, we smoke cigars and drink whiskey together. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is it starts with the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, that represents our Futures Directorate. They're doing the S&T and experimentation, the technical elements that Admiral Becker talked about um, that get into the entry point of development. It goes over to CDNI, our Capability Development Directorate, as a second amigo. They write the CONAMPS, and I, at some point, I need a requirement. I need an ICD or CDD. For an MTA, the minimum is an I, ICD, and that's great, because that allows us, on the material side, third, to move into a well-developed and articulated requirement, experiment, scientific-based, you know, repeatable mechanism that's worthy of investment for the force. So um, having it confined and, and um, unity of effort is really important there. And I think we're, we're blessed with that. So we're, we're looking to take advantage of that. 
Three amigos, that's my answer. <laughs> there you go. I mean, uh, and it, it seems you know, Admiral Moore and Admiral Peters from the Navy, the, a Navy equivalent to might be, it might be if you look at the concept for distributed maritime operations, we're gonna try to uh, deceive and confuse and distribute our forces so that the adversary has more targets to deal with. Um, creating a mission capability to deceive an enemy regarding our force disposition and actions is gonna require capabilities to be developed on ships, in the air, you know, on mission systems, then networks that go between them. So you've got multiple organizations that now need to work together to deliver something that's coherent at the end. And I, how, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you plan on doing that? Well, it takes a lot more collaboration than we've probably had in the past, and you're, you're right about the stovepipe. I think, you know, the gate, the gate review process that uh, RDA has now that's chaired with the vice chief is an opportunity at every step along the way in an acquisition process to bring in all the stakeholders and recognize that you're not just buying a ship or just buying a network, that there's an integrated uh, piece to this. And so we've got to do, do a lot better, and that, I think, within OpNav, that, that gate review process is the way at which we're kind of going to vet some of these things out. There's a blue and green aspect to it that we've got to remember. And the other piece is you know, we tend to focus only on the, on the platforms that are going to sea. Uh, we're finding more and more that as we, you know, we build these platforms and we integrate things, uh, that we, we neglect the shore piece of that that goes along with it, which is how do you sustain it later. Right. Uh, from the shipyard standpoint, hey, do we have the right dry docks? Do we have the right equipment to go do that? And so I think it's actually even gotten more complicated uh, and will continue to be more complicated going forward, and we've got to be a lot more collaborative than we've been in the past. But I do think the process that we're using today through the gate, gate reviews is the way, way, we're go way forward for us on trying to review. Yeah, the term that you don't hear as much uh, today as perhaps a few years ago is INI, the integration and interoperability. Uh, I think the reason why you don't hear it that much is because it's no longer new. We're, we're actually doing it. Uh, we've stood up within NAVAIR a program office that's responsible for INI, PMA 298. Uh, it's not tied to any particular platform. Uh, they're the ones that are leading the analysis of alternatives for the next generation air dominance. They're the ones that are producing the systems engineering products that are needed for NIFCA, Naval Integrated Fires. Uh, and uh, the, the key here is uh, the speed. So it's understanding the threat assessment, producing those systems engineering products that can be used for uh, the software updates for E2D, for Super Hornet, for Aegis, for our weapon systems. Uh, and that's happening. Uh, that's at the aviation side. And then at the Pentagon side, uh, we just sent one of our uh, program managers uh, who finished up a tour with our mission planning program office. It's going up to a digital integration office uh, at the Pentagon to help start tying this type of integration between the different systems commands. So uh, we'll monitor that closely, but I think that is gets, that speaks to the integration that you were talking about, Brian. It seems like a lot of this integration, though, has to do with the networks and, like Admiral Becker was saying, the data, um, you know, both you know internal to the platform, you know, through the data bus, but also by using radio, you know, radio communication links or other communication methods. So, so Admiral Becker, to what degree is are you your guys getting brought into these discussions about how to deliver a new mission capability, or is it end up being that the network's an afterthought once you've kind of decided what platforms and, and mission systems to use? Well, that's kind of a red meat question. <laughs> um, Sorry. The way we used to do it wasn't effective. Uh, and so we had to change it, and we're still changing that. Uh, as I think my colleagues have already talked about, there are a couple different ways. One is the gate review process. That's a, that's a check at the, at the Pentagon level. Uh, but as Admiral Peters discussed, the, the, there's real value in the far left and systems engineering to understand what those mission needs are and understand them in a way that um, are, we can model uh, and then model those needs against how we're going to deliver the capability. And so we've undertaken, uh, in particular, in the realm of C4I and space systems, uh, a rigorous process to look at what the mission threads are that are most critical to meet. And then we can tie that to other models uh, in a federated model scheme. So when you start to talk about model-based systems engineering, you can really start to pull the mission thread through 
from one platform to another system through the network, through the lightning bolts, and understand what really needs to occur. Uh, and if you really, really go varsity with that, uh, because you have the data, now you can start to create a, a digital representation of the capabilities that you've delivered. Well, that, uh, well, that's pretty cool, because now what happens? Especially in the network side of things, if something goes wrong in the real world, I know what right looks like. I got a way to not only operate, but sustain that capability and look to see what, that, what changes have occurred in order, and what I need to change back in order to fix it. All that, all that comes back to the data uh, and the upfront heavy lifting systems engineering that starts when you start to talk about what the mission need is. Now we can work across the syscoms. We have that structure. We have the technical architecture board. We have the, the teamwork across the syscoms where we can make that happen. And so what degree is, has that led to um, investment in command and control tools versus just you know, building networks? I mean, you think of C3 as a portfolio, you've got comm systems, you've got C2 tools. Has, has the investment in C2 tools increased because of the need to you know, better manage the integration of a, a widening collection of capabilities? First, we have to get after the infrastructure that's underneath it to make sure that that infrastructure is there. Uh, we, at the, those of you who heard the, uh, uh, the Department of the Navy CIO uh, speak at lunch yesterday, he talked about individuals accruing email addresses uh, like you might accrue old cell phones. <laughs> um, and that's because well, if you look at Air Wing 5 in Japan, you know, they might have an email address for when they're ashore in Japan, they have an email address for when they go out to the boat, they got an email address when they come back to to Fallon or, uh, or go to Guam. Um, we gotta fix that. Uh, and then we can start talking about uh, how do we improve the command and control even, even on our ships today. Uh, and, we're, and we're working on that. Uh, Admiral Moore, uh, the, uh, Nate, Nate Moore, uh, the, uh, so the Coast Guard's been deploying uh, a lot more frequently with naval forces or in, in operations that are increasingly what you know, a Navy force might have done, particularly look at the South China Sea and what you've been doing in the Pacific. Uh, to what degree are you um, trying to tie the, the lessons learned from those deployments into capability development? Is the, the Navy and the Marine Corps, have they been able to work with the Coast Guard to field the capabilities you need for maybe the next generation of those deployments? Yeah, the way, what we did in the, uh, for the 7th Fleet most recently this, uh, this past year with those two different deployments is, um, you know, the, the beauty of this under the National Fleet Board concept, right, is that those ships uh, are built and sustained, uh, you know, through a through a jointly managed program with with the Navy and F NAVC in particular. And so we, you know, th those ships have Navy type Navy owned equipment on them. They have uh, all the same uh, standards for mil spec design and everything that, that that a Navy ship does. So, so the beauty of those deployments this summer is uh, we were able to, uh, you know, we literally chopped, a, a, you know, TACON and OPCON to Seventh Fleet. I mean, during the period of time those ships were deployed. They did not work for us in the Coast Guard, right? And that, you know, we still paid their salaries, but it was, but that was about about it. And the and the beauty of that is then, the 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 operational commander, uh, the fleet commander, can then use those ships as he uh, or she seem, deems most most uh, useful. So what we're good at, which is low end conflict, uh, law enforcement, uh, things you wouldn't want to set a, you know, a BMD. Uh, DDG out to do, right, because it would be a waste of that asset where well, you can send a Coast Guard uh, cutter out there to uh, protect the sea lanes communication, that kind of thing, right? So um, so I think logistically we follow the same model. So when we when we chop those ships to 7th uh, Fleet, they the, the, we chop them to the 7th Fleet uh, for the four shop for support. So CASREP parts, uh, any, all of the uh, uh, connectivity, you know, through the satellite, all that was done uh, the same way that Seventh Fleet manages it for the rest of their their ships. So, I, the answer to for me, the answer to the question of sort of how do we prepare for great competition, great power competition, is to continue that model and, and and use that more robustly. If we have a true national fleet that, in times of conflict, can be uh, melded together, like I'm describing, then the support, the logistics for that, needs to be able to to meld together that way too, right? Because you know, the typical Coast Guard way that we do at CONUS is I ship parts FedEx, you know, to, to, the, to the search and rescue station in Florida or whatever, right? Well, that doesn't work, you know, in Oceania, that doesn't work in the South China Sea or, or in the Northern Arctic, uh, you know, in the North Sea, that kind of thing. So, so I think the, these, these 
overseas deployments have helped really push us in the direction of, of providing that sustainability uh, jointly with the, with the Navy. Have these have the deployments revealed some new capabilities that your cutters need to be able to effectively, um, you know, not, not obviously going into armed confrontations with the Chinese, but if you want to counter ISR systems that they have or you want to, you know, try to do some of the things that distributed maritime operations might uh, aspire to do. Have, has some of that, le have the, some of those lessons been able to get, you know, translated? They have, into they have. I mean, we have, uh, uh, you know, the idea again, if for again, for the Seventh Fleet Commander, you know, when those ships, uh, uh, you know, were, were in chopped in, the idea was they would be fully operational. There wouldn't, there would be, there would not be places they couldn't go, right? Or, or places where you would, he, he couldn't use them because they might, you know, be a missile sponge. So he, w he was really uh, key on having them fully operational in the sense of, you know, countermeasures and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, all, of the, all of the different suite of Navy type Navy owned equipment that we have on board those ships. But it revealed the fact that for us that, that to step up into that game at that level uh, is a huge resource demand on us that we're not used to. Right. And so we, you know, some of you may know this, but uh, underneath DHS, right, we have 11 statutory missions, yeah. and one of those is national defense. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a challenge. To be busy. Uh, so I got one more question, then we're going to turn it over to the audience. So if uh, audience members have questions, you can start posting up uh, by these uh, microphones that are strategically placed uh, throughout the uh, audience. Um, so the, the question I have is, uh, a lot of what we talked about today is um, changes in acquisition authorities, changes in the relationship between government and industry and developing new capabilities. Um, identifying ways to uh, integrate between organizations to better serve missions. Um, all of those start to make, make you wonder whether the traditional requirements process is, you know, if not dead, it's changing. You know, how, how, how do we you know, build requirements for new capabilities when we've got a lot more mechanisms to define what we need in a new system based on the art of the possible, based on what's happening within other services, based on what's happening with the threat and, and lessons learned from that op set of operations. So uh, are we envisioning a, a situation where we're gonna have to change how we define requirements that'll be much more responsive to you know, it, it, the, the art of the possible and what the threat is presenting? Or are we gonna continue down the road of trying to define requirements in isolation? And if so, what does that imply for the sustainability of future systems? Because that's a lot of what our requirements process is designed to do is to foresee the ability of a new system to be sustained in the future. So I don't know who wants to take that first. Well, I don't think, uh, one, I think you got it. You can't, the requirements development process can't be done in a vacuum. And it's a lot more complex domain today to build a requirements set than it may have been 15, 20, 25 years ago. So I don't think the requirements definition process is broken or needs to be changed. I just think you have to recognize it's a, uh, it's a lot more complex warfighting world than it was yeah. 25, 30 years ago. Uh, but the basic requirements definition and understanding what it is you want and what it is you want that platform to do, I think remains unchanged. Uh, that's core to what we're gonna do. How you go about defining, you know, building those requirements is, uh, I think, would, I would argue, be a lot more complex today than it was 25, 30 years ago. But the basic mechanics of sitting down and understanding what it is you want, what type of capability, based on the requirement, what, could, what can industry build for you? Does that meet your need? What will that cost? How long will it take to get there? What are the trade-offs? I don't think that fundamentally changes. No. No, I'll just... Uh, just briefly, uh, from the traditional acquisition process, where I see changes coming into effect is uh, the use of more prototyping. And there's lots of different ways to do that. We mentioned, uh, you know, being able to prototype uh, industry ideas uh, at our warfare centers, at our labs, uh, the test capability that we have. Uh, it, mostly it, it's about communication, being able to communicate the requirements uh, more effectively, especially as they get more complicated, as Admiral Moore said. Uh, that's an area that we're still working on. Uh, but to the extent that we can prove out technology, uh, you know, our normal acquisition process where we release an RFP, we get the proposals back, and then we go through this evaluation process where we're really trying to see, you know, on paper, you know, who understands the requirement the best, but we really have no sense of what that capability will bring, uh, what the reliability of that capability is. And so to the extent that we can 
get in early with some of this prototyping. Some of our most successful programs from an acceleration standpoint have been in just those situations where we've been able to prove out the technology before we had to go through the acquisition process. Thank you. In the uh, in a software area, um, there are ways that we can not throw away the requirements process because it, it's there for a reason, uh, but maybe uh, evolve it based on the kinds of capabilities and the timelines that we're talking about. So we're not going to throw out the ideas of uh, objective and threshold requirements and what you have to meet, but maybe in some places the minimum viable product is actually the threshold that you, you'll accept. Now, that takes communications and transparency between the fleet operators, the technical community, uh, and the sponsors uh, willing to accept that it's not, it, it, it may be a minimum viable product and not everything you wanted. Now, who else is involved in that though? You gotta look at the test community and how do we test? How do we test for something to see that it's uh, operationally effective if we're talking about an MVP versus a threshold or objective? Uh, and then there's our oversight. Uh, if Congress appropriated dollars for a particular capability, how do we have the, the trust and transparency that when we say we can deliver this now, that's acceptable to deliver as we continue to work on in improving it, but we don't wait for perfect uh, and leave the operator, leave the fleet without that capability that we could put out there. Um, I'll add three points to it that, from my perspective. I think the uh, Navy and Marine Corps have uh, never been uh, in a better spot on requirements development. Uh, this particular uh, you know, PB21 rollout has been very closely linked between N9 and CDNI. Um, an example is uh, the way that we're going about integrated uh, naval force structure assessment. Um, and we're, we're just, we absolutely have to be that way because that's the way that we fight. So it has to be that way um, in force development. Um, and on the experimentation side, to get after what Admiral Peters had mentioned on prototyping, doing it in a competitive way, tapping that element of industry that, that's non-traditional, uh, we do uh, in the Navy Marine Corps team as well. So that's Antex um, and uh, co-hosted and, and uh, co-participatory, you know, kind of thing in an environment that's likely to yield a requirement or a formative requirement. I think third is just in a very simple sense is people. And diversity matters, right? So um, I came into acquisition off the Navy staff writing requirements for uh, black bottom and, and, and uh, gray hulled ships, uh, working very closely with NAVC on that. I, I just don't see someone being helpful in the acquisition community as a program manager or otherwise, uh, a tester, if they're not conversant in that type of vernacular. You, got, you need to get into that world and we need, you know, this is the, um, the, the, the personnel and the workforce excellence issue where you really rely on people who are diverse and can be, um, can switch off channel from either T&E to requirements and into program management or financial management. So that's really important and I think, I think that really counts because the people, it's a people business and that's, that's the bottom line. Uh, well, thank you very much. So let's uh, uh, turn it over to the audience. Uh, sir, I, are you, do you have a question, I Admiral Daly? I do. I'll just interject here. We've got the strongest possible signal from the Commandant of the Marine Corps and from the CNO that they want to get at integrated naval warfare. And it's very believable, and I think they're pretty serious. So I was just going to ask the systems commanders, because you're responsible for so many platforms and programs. Is there an early opportunity, whether it's a platform, a program, or just an area, just maybe cite one each that you think is ripe for this that could lead to uh, something good in the integration front, either from a capability standpoint or a savings standpoint? Thank you. I'll start by just saying uh, UAS um, and counter UAS. I think there's a tremendous uh, integration there for the naval forces, and uh, we, we have some success with that already and need to build on it. Yeah, so I was going to go in the unmanned, clearly is an, an area where there's integrated. Uh, on the combat system side of the house, as we evolve into AMDR, there's ops, you know, there's great opportunity there for integrated across and how you use that from a warfighting state standpoint across, across the uh, syscoms and across the warfighting domains. Um, I'd offer up long-range precision fires, uh, what we do on ship, how we uh, 
translate and uh, push select tracks uh, on the Navy's backbone into uh, uh, marine uh, command and control systems that are designed implicitly to provide surface fires uh, from a marine detachment in an EABO ashore. Uh, that, that's very real, and that takes us back to our roots as part of our culture. And, and clearly how we blend our networks uh, so that uh, it, rather than Marines bringing all the gear and their own vertical stack, if you will, onto a ship and then having to take it off back again where they go somewhere, how do we just extend one network across the entire integrated maritime fight? And for uh, Rear Admiral Moore, I just want to ask from the Coast, not to leave out the Coast Guard, what's something that you would like to see the Navy and Marine Corps SISCOMs do to help you? I think, I think for us what would be really helpful is if we um, continue to coordinate on, on uh, depot availability uh, capacity in the country, right, both, both aviation and, and uh, surface side. We, we struggle, uh, the Coast Guard, you know, on ship repair, for example, we have one organic shipyard out of Baltimore, which is not, it's not nearly big enough to, to take, it doesn't do anything for us out here in the Pacific, obviously, and uh, so, you know, we, as, as the Navy has pushed out into the commercial uh, shipyard industry now in the last couple of years, they really, really have uh, sort of blocked out the sun in terms of uh, our availability of, of using those commercial yards that we relied on, and, and so if you're a, if you run a ship repair business and the, and the Navy wants to roll in and dry dock, uh, you know, do a $40 million dry dock for an LHA, and we say, hey, can you, how about our little Coast Guard ship for $2 million? Uh, you know, we just, we just don't see any really responses, it, it, almost no responses today to a lot of our uh, dry dock and dockside repair packages, which is, which means we pay for the ones that do respond. So I think we just need more coordination on that, I think. <laughs> we make uh, all the shipbuilders sign a non-competitive uh, clause that says they can With only the Coast be Guard. Navy works. Yeah. Sorry about that. We'll, we'll work on that. We are. We are. And we are working on it. I mean, I, we, this is not a new revelation or anything. We've been uh, working that quite a bit um, to try to figure out how we can coordinate schedules, for example, right? If, I, if, if my folks know sort of when the Navy has little gap, because the Coast Guard would be filler work between the Navy projects. That's how we do it. And the yards love that. And instead of us saying, hey, we got to do our project during the six weeks, maybe what's, what six weeks you have available between big Navy projects that we can use? And so we're, we're, we're getting there. Yeah, I think we'd, we ought to sit down and talk about that because, you know, I think uh, stable, predictable work in the ports is, is what gets us the performance level that we want. It gets the industry to grow capacity. So uh, there's an opportunity for us to marry our maintenance programs up. I'm, I'm all here. So let's, let's have that conversation. Great, so we'll, we'll move on to other questions. So when you uh, ask a question, make sure you uh, state your name and your affiliation, um, so assert. Kai Alberg, member of the U.S. Naval Institute. Uh, it's probably fair to say that software and having up-to-date software will increase in importance over the next decade. I've read that a major software upgrade to the F-35 is likely to cost in the billions of dollars. Uh, when you look at private companies like Tesla, they seem to have a very streamlined system to continuously push software update up out to their products. How close is it realistic to believe that we would be able to get to that model, and what obstacles do you see would have to be overcome to get closer to that model? <laughs> well, let's just look at um, Alice for F-35 and the importance of establishing the architecture and Ms. Lord, uh, in the previous session, talked a little bit about Alice and F-35, and she's very much engaged in making sure that we get that correct. So uh, that's really going to be the, uh, the crux of F-35 software development, at least on the support side, is uh, getting the architecture right for Alice. Um, what are the obstacles? I mean, we're, the obstacles are that... Uh, we already have a lot of these aircraft that are operating and uh, transitioning the system uh, in operations is going to be, I think, the, the biggest challenge. We're going to jump over here to Megan. Hi, Megan Eckstein with USNI News. Uh, back to requirements development. Um, on the frigate program, the Navy successfully pulled industry and operators and requirements folks and budget folks together early on in the requirements evaluation team process. Um, and we heard a lot of great things about the results that that yielded. 
Um, but for the next two programs with CHAMP and which with the large surface combatant, um, I know CHAMP got thrown back because it was looking like it would cost too much and large surface combatant got postponed a bit. So I wondered if those point to any limitations to the RET process or if perhaps they um, kept the Navy from going down the wrong path. And then if the other panelists could maybe comment on any um, pros and cons that they've experienced on bringing industry and operators in early. I don't think there's a limitation to the process. I think the process is right. I think the key is, uh, back to the, you know, the, to the requirements, is uh, you know, what is it exactly that you want, and then getting a realistic cost of what that is. And w those two tend to collide often. So I've watched the large surface combatant with great interest <laughs> over the last four years. And frankly, you know, we've, I think we've pushed it to the right for good reasons. We think Flight 3 uh, meets the needs. I think the threat's evolving. We're looking at unmanned, so we don't want to rush into this. Uh, but clearly, you know, as we work through that process, uh, you know, the, the first go-around was a platform that was going to be pretty expensive. And so I think, uh, you know, you're hearing the Secretary and the CNO talk about distributed maritime operations. You're talking, uh, you're hearing them talk about high-low mix. Does everything have to be a high-end process? So I, I think that's, uh, I think the, the requirements evaluation team process works. Uh, I think it's the best way to do it. I think involving industry early is the best way to, to do it. Uh, but you're going to have to have some cost realism in there up front uh, in terms of uh, defining what you, you know, the, hey, I'm not willing to pay more than this. And those two often collide too late in the game, in, in my opinion. So I think the process is fine. I think we've got to continue to fine tune it. And uh, I think frigate's a great example where it's going to work, and we've got to go learn from that going forward. Thank you. Uh, sir? They've been waiting longer. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> Bill Hamlet, uh, Naval Institute Proceedings. So inherent in great power competition is an adversary who's great or is moving quickly. Uh, Admiral Becker, you asked if the PLA was here. No hands went up, but I guess they're sort of the elephant in the room. So the, the, the adversary is moving quickly and developing and fielding capabilities quickly. How is uh, the threat uh, aspect uh, driving your challenges? A and do you feel confident you're keeping ahead of it or keeping up with it, pacing the threat? Uh, that, that's my question. That's sort of open-ended. <laughs> so, uh, Admiral Becker, what do you think? Let's start. Uh, well, for those of you who are industry folks, uh, we need your help. Uh, we need your help making sure that you protect our data. And there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, we're, the, the department is leaning forward to try to help you help us uh, with the CMMC process. Uh, that's a you know, certification process, and there are levels to that, and uh, there's still some, uh, I think, some error in the system that uh, we're working out, the differences between the NIST standards and CMMC, but the punchline is uh, we need your help. We need your help to protect our data when it's in your organizations and in your networks and when it's in your suppliers and, and the second and third tier suppliers. So how do we, how, where does that go? How do we think about that differently? Uh, we're looking for your help because we need to protect our data. So related to, to Bill's question, the, 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 the DOD is pursuing a new concept for joint, uh, all, joint all domain command and control, <laughs> as well as a new joint warfighting concept. Uh, to what degree have um, your organizations been brought into that discussion about what are the implications of this new approach to warfare for the kinds of systems that we need to buy and the kinds of ways they need to be able to work together? Has that, has that conversation been happening? It has. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll step into that one first. The, uh, the Marine Corps is kind of in a unique position where we uh, are integrated as a naval force. We uh, uh, move ashore from from uh, a naval ship, a um, surface combatant, and uh, having the uh, ability to connect uh, back to that ship and to command and control forces ashore uh, with the <coughs> Navy is absolutely essential. But once we're ashore, uh, we've got this uh, inescapable uh, need to interoperate with the U.S. Army. And so there's, there's a vertical situation, there are horizontal situations in terms of uh, uh, both lines of communication and, and signals and um, across the spectrum of warfare that, that you have to plan for. Uh, JADC2 gives us a, a uh, uh, really uh, opportune venue to 
to get to both of those things from the course perspective? Because that's just reality. I'll just add to the uh, answer by saying that, you know, there's always going to be an aspect of reaction uh, as we are exposed to our adversaries' capabilities. But for the most part, I think, you know, the path that we're on, our roadmaps, our technology roadmaps, the areas that industry is leading in, uh, I, I think we provide very high quality equipment uh, to the warfighter. Uh, and, and we're at the point of, you know, continuing to look, not only just look for those game changing technologies, but to refine the technology that we have. So uh, I think we're in a very good place in terms of the technology that we have and we're gonna continue to improve it. Sir, one more. Okay, one more. You guys can fight it out. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Too tall. I'm going to pick this up. Uh, Jeff Zalewitz with Navy Times. Um, excuse me, a uh, question for Rear Admiral Becker. You mentioned uh, sailors getting different email addresses depending on their duty station and never having like a uniform uh, account. This was brought up in the Chief Information Officer's report last month. Um, so, kind of a two part question. You know, when can sailors and Marines, in your view, expect? to just have a single, you know, first dot last name at navy.mil email throughout their career. And uh, perhaps more importantly, how did the Navy get to this point? Um, you know, the, the CIO told my colleagues that, you know, the Navy systems are 15 years behind the private sector. Uh, you know, all these reports about Navy hacks, you know, via the defense industry, there's reports today that a big supplier uh, got hacked and that information is showing up online. Um, you know, in your view, how did the Navy get so far behind on this and how long is it going to take? I know this is kind of a ongoing, evolving effort and the report made that clear, but how do you guys get, you know, out of this hole, so to speak? And, and if I'm not characterizing that right, you know, please let me know. Thanks. I, I'll, I'll try, I know we, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep this kind of brief and we can maybe catch up. Um, part of it is the mindset of, of what the network's purpose was. In particular, our, our enterprise network. You know, sh think shore, both shore CONUS and shore out of out of the United States. Um, it, it was looked at as an admin function, uh, and over time, as the, the top line started coming down, uh, and the uh, the criticality to find efficiencies uh, to save dollars, uh, particularly post 2012. Uh, you, well, you can turn to support structures, the administrative nature of a network. Uh, and you can harvest from that, uh, and we did. Uh, we harvested quite a bit of savings and efficiencies in our network, uh, but that meant we couldn't do certain things to our network that we needed to do, the modernization that we couldn't, uh, couldn't put in place. Uh, and so we have the network that we paid for. Uh, and over time, that gap widens. Um, so now we're on a journey uh, to try to assess how we can move forward uh, and how we can start to build out that network, which supports our warfighting capabilities, um, because the network itself is a warfighting platform. That different mindset is going to change how we look at the network. And, and if you read the uh, documents, both from the DOD and, and the uh, DON CIO, um, and even the vectors from uh, Secretary Modley, uh, the network is not a place to take efficiencies. The network is a place where we're gonna fight. Uh, and that goes, goes the same for our networks at sea. So we've, we have a path where we'll be collapsing the Naval Enterprise Network from our OCONUS networks, uh, today called OneNet, uh, but it's OneNet Far East and OneNet Europe and OneNet Pacific, which is, I think, three nets. <laughs> um, so we'll collapse OneNet uh, into the Naval Enterprise Network, which is NMCI here in CONUS, and that's a first step. Uh, and then looking to the future, how we uh, start to migrate identity management not just in terms of the networks, but identity management itself, uh, that's, that's how we'll get after that. Very quick, quick follow-up. When can a sailor expect to have, like, one email address? I don't have an answer for you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sir. Hi. Mike Mann. I'm a retired SWO. Um, so the, one of the key requirements in the RFP for the FFGX is what we call, or what I think the Navy refers to, as the Frigate Architecture Framework. And that clearly uh, is a new paradigm uh, in that design. And I'm curious if that model is going to be carried forward in 
future ships, have you seen su enough success with it on the FFGX that you would carry that forward? And I'm curious about the relationship bet between you, Admiral Moore, and Admiral Becker. And if I could impose one other question for Admiral Peters. I think I got my first briefing on what became the Joint Strike Fighter in 1994. Um, What's the timeline for the development of the next uh, fighter, and is it going to take anywhere near as long as it did for the JSF? Do you want to go first? Well, it's hot. Okay, okay, so I'll, uh, I'll address the second question first. Uh, and let me start by saying that uh, F-35 is an amazing capability, uh, and it did take a, a long time to develop, and in some ways we're, we're still refining that design. Uh, and uh, it, but it is a tremendous platform that we're going to fly for many years. The next generation air dominance, as I mentioned before, is already underway. We've completed an analysis of alternatives for that platform. And depending on the platform itself, I think we'll determine the timeline. We're still looking at the 2030s for that uh, time frame. Uh, and, uh, some of it is budget dependent, but again, some of it is really the, the approach that, that's taken. But uh, we're, we haven't started in earnest on that uh, program yet. So uh, will it take as long as the uh, F-35? I don't think so. Uh, and I, I, because I just don't think we can afford to take that long anymore. Uh, but we're looking at uh, right now mid 2030s. So uh, to the second question, uh, are we going to follow the same process on large service combatant? I think that remains to be seen. What I think is uh, we're going to go see how the FFGX comes out, and we're going to go. I think we like the process we use, so there's a lot to to um, to like about the process that we would we would roll forward in L L to the large service combatant. I think we're going to see uh, when we down select here and start building the ship, we're going to learn. You know, did we get it exactly the way we wanted to? So. I, I don't want to commit that we're going to be using the exact same process on large service combatant. It's hard to imagine uh, that we're going to come up with a completely new process. I think the way we've done it here is a model for how we'd like to go you know, forward on the shipbuilding side of the house uh, to reduce risk and get a platform to the, to the fleet faster. And uh, just to tie that off, uh, the way we'll stay integrated uh, through the requirements process is but with people. Uh, we have people embedded in PO ships today to help us stay <coughs> tied to the program, um, and I think that's going to uh, pay dividends for us. Thanks, Admiral. Last question. Thank you. Good morning. I'll try and keep this concise. Uh, I'm new to the acquisitions field, came from the cybersecurity stuff, and the one concern we're always focused on is talent management and retention. I was reading a few weeks ago that the time requirements to be an acquisitions professional, a uh, uniformed acquisitions professional, have increased. And so my question to you, gentlemen, is do you see a slump in uniformed acquisitions workforce as the requirements to be an acquisitions professional start to increase? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. And I, uh, I'll say for on, on probably about three different uh, vantage points. Number one, by inserting professionals into every phase of force development, you get more experience opportunities. So you can be at N95 and write requirements for amphibious ships and uh, have that account for your experience tour. You can uh, do a tour at uh, the Wrinkle Warfighting Lab or at Naval Search Lab. Uh, th there is there's structure uh, throughout the naval enterprise there that, that provides you opportunity. Two, I'll tell you that um, if promotion is any measure of success, the Acquisition Corps is outpacing the rest of the Marine Air Ground Task Force workforce or, or labor pool, if you want to look at it that way, uh, by about 10 percentage points to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, uh, excuse me, almost 30 percentage points to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and uh, about 10 percentage points higher to the rank of Colonel. So there's a recognition in the Marine Corps for this uh, critical skill set. You know, and, and then the third thing I'll leave you with is uh, when you're modernizing the force, when you're looking very distinctly at a modernization effort, it demands that you have trained professionals to do it. So, um, you know, 
bring a cigar and a bourbon and we'll, we'll talk about it, is what I'd like to say. I'll, I'll be there on Friday, General. All right. <laughs> so I see how uh, the Marine Corps is keeping their talent management in check. <laughs> we may have to adopt some of these uh, techniques. The, uh, it, it, it's an interesting question and, uh, about talent management in uniform. And uh, mostly as we continue to always manage the size of our uniform workforce, uh, those billets are just like all other billets are, are targets. So, uh, the, but we are still seeing a lot of folks that are interested in technical and acquisition jobs, uh, which is a good thing. And I think there's a lot more uh, willingness on the part of our naval leaders to let folks go do that. So they can go uh, do a technical or an acquisition job and then go back to the fleet for the department head tour or uh, you know, in between department head tour and command, they can get that in and we're, br and we're bringing those folks back in to be program managers. And the, it, it's absolutely critical. Uh, uh, you know, within NAVAIR, uh, the, the uniform number with the, of our employees is very small compared to the civilians, but you know, they're really force multipliers. They're the ones that bring the mission relevance so uh, at every opportunity that I have, I try to encourage folks that are interested in acquisition uh, or uh, test and evaluation and those type of things, say, let's, let's get our talent there let's, and then get them back out to the fleet to do their, those requirements <coughs> and uh, you know, continue that cycle because that's what's gonna make our weapon systems more effective. So thanks for the question. All right, well, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, Bill, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, on behalf of the Naval Institute and FCA International, we thank our speakers and panelists today for taking their time and, and sharing their insights. We'd like to present each of you with a token of our appreciation, a Naval Institute book, A Brief Guide to Maritime Strategy by Naval War College Professor Jim Holmes. And also want to thank, uh, special thanks to our sponsor today, Lockheed Martin, and to our uh, audience. And before you go back to the main hall and get ready for lunch, uh, please uh, um, use the West app uh, to provide some feedback on this session in the uh, session survey. Thank you very much. <laughs>